So David Mason is going to be joining me in a moment. So David set up the Sales Managers Academy just uh, a couple of years ago now, I believe, maybe longer. Um, and he's going to tell us a little bit more about that. And it's a, a community built around supporting sales leadership and managers. So if you're new into management or looking after sales teams uh, or sales leadership, uh, then go check that out. Definitely worth exploring. Um, a very proficient trainer and consultant, a capable human being, and uh, uses all of those skills as well to support military veterans in starting their own companies too. And that's just what I've scraped off of his LinkedIn profile. So it is probably a lot more to have. So uh, David Mason, welcome to the South Coast Sellers Club. How are you doing? Uh, welcome, Ben. And um, yeah, thanks. And, and welcome to everybody. Uh, really pleased to be able to join you today. Awesome. But so how, how did I do? Did I miss anything out? Any, any <coughs> information about David? Uh, yeah, well, no, I mean, obviously, Sales Managers Academy is something that uh, I set up a couple of years ago because um, I, I really feel that sales leadership from sales management is, is a neglected area and actually a really important area because if our leadership and management is going well, then uh, our, our teams will perform well and you know our businesses will do well. Uh, and I was particularly um, keen to be able to support what I call the unintentional sales leader. Uh, that, that individual suddenly... Uh, finds themselves in a sales leadership role and it wasn't perhaps what they were thought of but um, it happened to me a few years ago actually and I can't remember what I went through uh, and I think it's true as a lot of business owners you kind of have this idea and this passion you want to, want to um, develop a, a business around and suddenly you find yourself actually having to do uh, sales and then as you build your team of sales leadership and it's, it's probably not what you thought you're signing up for so uh, we're, we're here to support uh, those leaders as well. Fantastic. I love that. A accidental sales leaders. See it a lot. A lot of people get into business because they love what they do and then realize they've got to turn into salespeople, which is a lot of people's fear. Yeah. Um, but it doesn't doesn't need to be, which is partly why we exist. So, um, yeah, no, awesome. Well, listen, thank you so much for giving up your time to be with us. And um, we're obviously talking about seven strategies to minimize the impact of a downturn. Now, um, I'm assuming this is quite timely. Well, if you saw the news this morning, <laughs> so uh, um, yes, and, and I think, you know, let's, let's uh, I mean, a recession technically is when there's two quarters of negative, it's called negative growth, not not sort of uh, whatever it is. So, you know, with a six months of, of, of negative growth. But I mean, downturns can come in, in, in all shapes and sizes. I mean, I remember I was in a business uh, in 2001, just after 9-11, and our particular business model is predicated on flying people around the world to meet other people who's thrown around the world to do learning and, and training and development. And, and organizations said, well, well, nobody's going to fly for six months. So, you know, it, it can be, it can actually be very specific or it can be very general as, as we're probably seeing now. Yeah, so. yeah absolutely. And um, so we've been chatting obviously before this to find out a little bit more about you and, and what you want to talk about. But um, I think you said you were starting to count up how many, downturns or recessions you've been through you uh well if, if, this, one actually, that number? <laughs> if this one comes into fruition i'd be number five um okay. uh, and i think <clears throat> um the first one was it doesn't really count because it was 1980 i was just 81 i was really starting off my career this kind of shows you how old they are um and i was kind of sheltered because uh, i was working for heinz at the time and that was kind of a, a big enough brand and i was so junior uh it didn't really affect me um I think the one in 1991 is the one I remember for all the wrong reasons in, in the sense that, um, you know, the business I was in got really caught out by that um, and we actually went under. Um, so that was kind of a statutory experience. Um, and I, th I think that then the one of 2008 and 2009 is slightly different. You remember that some people here will probably remember the financial crisis uh, of, of that time. And that actually came came out came about really quickly. There wasn't any time to prepare for that one, um, in the sense it was a shock to the system. Um, and and but actually, um, you know, all the lessons of 1991 stuck with me. Um, and the team I was I had taken over in 2007, we actually kind of mobile. And some of this, this strategies are going to perhaps discuss later. Kind of evolved after that. And afterwards, I kind of sat and after three years of getting above market growth and I sat down and went, what did we actually do that actually helped us not only survive, but thrive in, in, in that time. Um, so I'm happy to be able to share some of my thoughts around that today. Brilliant. Brilliant. And that, you know, that's the thing I love about this as well. This is not theory. This is proven, lived in, delivered work. So 
definitely want to want to be listening. And I, you know, some of the things that I found when again when when working with leaders in in businesses that aren't potentially going the way they want them, not even in a downturn, it's sometimes people do just sit and wait. And you know, hope is very much not a strategy here. And we there are things that you can actually do to get ahead of this curve uh, and give yourself a uh, not like yeah, you say, not only a, an opportunity to to mitigate some of the risk, but actually outperform previous performances during a downturn. You know, many, many great new startups have, have been created uh, in downturns as well as uh, as well as businesses thriving and surviving. So um, yeah, I think for, for my own business as well, um, we've spoken about it. So I've had the teaser, I know what's about to come, but you know, I, I've already applied some of these into to my own business as well. So thank you for, for, for sharing this in advance. So, I mean, where, where do you want to kick off? Like you, you lead, Let, let's chat and see, see where we yeah, end okay. up. So. I think I want to kick, up, kick off with um, what, what my experience, what typically happens um, in, in a downturn in, in sort of organizations that are buying organizations, what happens to their buying behavior. And, and you kind of do this as consumers as well, but I'm just going to sort of concentrate more on, um, you know, uh, business to business type stuff, um, and and what what happens is the notion of risk starts to change, um, and then as a result of that, people's behaviour starts to change, and you know what what I've experienced is, uh, and there's some uh, people just started writing writing at this and sort of saying you know, previously buyers might have been concerned about. Missing out, so FOMO. You know, they, they they wanted to kind of be on the on, on with the latest trend and, and be up there and and kind of uh, really sort of making sure that they were in the sweet spot, if you like. And and that switched to what's called now FOMO, FOMU, F O M U, which is fear of messing up. So the the um, the, the notion of risk changes, um, and. You know, so people will now be sort of much more considered about their decision making, uh, and, and kind of back in the day, some, some of you, you know, may remember this, but IBM for many years um, had this sort of thing that sort of nobody ever got sacked for buying IBM because it was a, the safe bet, <laughs> if you like. And for a lot of any any sort of um, brands coming and trying to challenge IBM back in the day had to really get over that sort of solid view of IBM as a is a safe bet. So, um, so, so what happens, tends to happen is, you know, the nation, this idea of risk uh, suddenly emerges. Do, you know, I'm, if I start to make decisions, how will this affect me and my role and, and, and my business? And typically what happens in organizations is um, things get, I, I think please, over the next three months, um, you know, a lot of expenditure will be reined in. Um, it would be critical, it's, unless it's really critical. Uh, even if it's budgeted and it's not spent, it will kind of be ranging. People will start to build cash reserves. And decision making will change in the sense that uh, levels of authority will change. Um, you know, previously, if you had a level of authority for, for, for buying, uh, you'll suddenly find now that's got to be signed off by maybe one or two other, other people much higher in the organization. And probably the notion of risk is that actually people will spend a lot more time consulting with other people just so they can be seen to be in, a, in, a, in, in the right spot and making the right decision. And they're not going out on a limb on, on, on their own. Um, so the, the stakeholders involved in the decision will increase as well. So that obviously from a sales point of view, that just means more time talking to more people uh, about, about things. So that the sales cycle slows down as, as well. And what, what can people be doing about that? So, I mean, I, I've certainly seen it with um, so I support a lot of tech companies as an example, and they they are trying to bring in multiple stakeholders into that buying process, you know, and, and identifying that there is probably a user of your solution, the end recipient, and then someone with the purse strings. So identifying, you know, what that what that buying process is internally is going to be crucial for you as a salesperson as well or as a business owner, right? Yeah, and I, I think, you know, I, I, let's, let's sort of pick out one of the strategies, um, which is kind of at the front, at the back end of everything else, but actually uh, these are all interconnected. Um, and it, it's called Up Your Opportunity Management Game. Um, so as, as you're sort of trying to pursue uh, an, an opportunity, and again, some, some people have quite relatively short sales cycles and some people have, you know, longer sales cycles. But as you say, Ben, there's more people getting involved. 
Um, I think the first consideration is really, are, are, are we talking about with our customers about the right issues? You know, are we, are we sort of having conversations with them about the things that they're thinking about? And in terms of what our proposition might, might help with. So that, that's what I call the, sort of the right issue. Are, are we actually going to be part of the conversation because we're actually in tune with what they're, they're considering? And then secondly, are we actually talking to the right, the right people about, about those, those issues? So as, as you mentioned, there's, there's users. Users might not necessarily be the right people to be talking about right now. Um, and then are we getting the right messages across? And, you know, and the, by right messages, <clears throat> are we rethinking our messages that's appropriate for now? You know, when you're, when you're talking to people, you know, they listen in, on the news on the way into wherever they work or even, you know, if they're working from home, they've watched the morning telly before they sort of slunk off to wherever they, they sit. You know, the, the one thing that might be on the back of the mind is, you know, e economic downturn, Bank of England saying this, you know, um, quasi cartel saying this, you know. Um, and it, it, it all kind of seeps in. Um so are we talking to them about something that's relevant to now as opposed to what was relevant maybe two or three months ago? Absolutely. The relevance thing is really interesting as well. I think something that we've explored a lot here before is that uh, we as business owners or service providers do this thing. And yeah. my ideal customer is that sort of business. But I think where we need to be doing now, and you know, one thing I'd urge you all to be doing is going, you know, lifting the lid on that and going, all right, well, that's my ideal customer, but who are the actors within that? So who are the users? Who are the internal advocates? Who are the buyers? And then think about that from a personality perspective, from a, a hopes and fears perspective about them as a human being and as a persona as well, because I think, you know, there, there may be, in fact, there probably is a lot of um, roles out there that, you know, certainly training, Brilliant. I'm right in the fire and light here. But training, sadly, is one of the first things to go in a downturn uh, when it shouldn't be. And, you know, I can I can sing about all the reasons why all day long. But but actually recognizing that if I was an in-house trainer, uh, I might be worried that actually is my job at risk. So I'm not going to be too worried about buying your product or service because I'm facing inwards a little bit as well. So as a task, maybe spend some time thinking about who the individual actors are within your buying process and what their motivations, hopes and fears might be. Yeah, and, and I think whilst, whilst you're doing that as well, Ben, that's a, that's a great suggestion. And again, you know, in the, in the learning world, um, you know, people are making very easy decisions or seemingly easy decisions. I will cut that. We won't spend so much on marketing or... Um, you know, we'll, we'll cut back on this. No Christmas parties, no, that kind of kind of stuff. Um, um, yeah, but sometimes these are false economies. Um, and you know, one of the things that you know, I was I was in a learning business in, in two thousand and eight, um, uh, and you know, one of the things we actually spent a lot of time on was actually revisiting our value proposition. And the the idea was, you know. Uh, and again, this is kind of, I think this is a fundamental strategy that, you know, revisit your value proposition. Um, you know, is it still compelling? <laughs> will, will it get people to pay, atten uh, pay, uh, pay attention? Um, yeah, will it pass what I call the so what test? Um, and then you can start to think about um, how you then sort of, you know, t talk, talk to customers and potential customers about that. And the, 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 I was thinking about this this morning. You know, what 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 is the ideal value proposition right right now? And I think if you can help people achieve more and spend, have them spend less doing it, that would to me to seem to be the ideal message. Now, how that manifests itself in everybody's business um, is is obviously up, up, up to them. But I think if you can say to somebody, you know, you, you can achieve more of what you're trying to achieve, and I can help you do that more cost effectively or you know with less effort um I, I think at least you'll get a hearing yeah definitely and, and you know in, in terms of if you're wondering you know what on earth is a value proposition uh and then how do i even start i think you know something that 
again, we, we've explored before is around um, really understanding the wants and needs of that buyer or that user, and then answering that question, not telling them what you do, but answering the question or showing how you achieve an outcome. And, and I think it's, you know, if you are, um, and you know, that's features, advantages, benefits, you are suffering with a um, inability to hire somebody for your team. The knock on effect of that may well be that you are losing revenue or your client delivery project client deliveries are late or whatever the impact of inaction is. Uh, then the feature, which is what you do, the advantage is why you're great, but the benefit is the thing they're going to want. That's the value there. So, which means you don't have to worry about having empty seats, which means you won't be losing money by not having a salesperson, which means you won't be X, Y, Z. That's the bit that's going to help you really position yourself rather than I've seen you do this thing. I do that thing you know, can we dance? And nobody's interested in those conversations at the moment, because like you say, those decisions are being made at a, uh, at a finance level and a line item on a spreadsheet. You know, let's just take that number away rather than making any logical or emotional decisions about it. Yeah, um, yeah sorry, completely stole your thunder, go on then. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that kind of just takes me onto um, kind of an extension of, of, of that. Um, because your customer doesn't operate in, in, in a vacuum. Y your customer operates in a, you know, for want of a better term, we've always called it a value chain. So you know, it, it, if I go to the pub and I'm drinking a, a pint of beer, which I have, has been known to do from time to time, you know, me drinking that pint of beer is at the end of a long series of activities where people have added value right through from the people who blew the hops originally. All, all the way through that allows me to, you know, to be sitting there having having my my point of, point of beer. So, you know, the landlords are now concerned about some of the things that uh, are impacting them. Uh, the brewers are now worried about some of the things that are impacting them. Uh, particularly, they're bringing hops in from the US. You know, then I was just talking about exchange rates earlier on. You know, so their costs are going to go up. So your, your customers operating in in a in a in a, in a context of they have customers, they have suppliers. Um, so if you can help them under, think about how, well, first of all, you can understand what it is that they're trying to do um, to make sure that they can serve their customers better. And then you can find a way to show how your value proposition helps them do that. Uh, again, you're more likely to be part of the con a conversation that as this vendor said, you know, you do that, we do this. Um, it's understanding why they do that and who they do it for and actually how you can help them do that um, better in, in some sort of way. Or, you know, it might be it help them increase sales or it might be to help them make that transaction with their customers more cheaply, which would be kind of good news for them. Um, and certainly finance and financial conversations are increasingly going to be part of uh, any transaction over the next sort of few months because... Um, you know, as, as Ben said, line items on spreadsheets are being looked at by uh, people in the organisation. Because typically organisations turn to the CFO or uh, the finance guys and say, right, OK, how, how, how can we take costs out of, out of the business? And it's usually quite a blunt, blunt approach. Um, the opportunity for, uh, for salespeople is to actually be part of that conversation, but in, in, a, in a sort of uh, more sophisticated way by, by actually showing that um, what you're doing actually has a financial benefit as just as well as a, a sort of uh, a product related or a service related benefit as well. Yeah, brilliant. I like that a lot. I think the, um, yeah, so, so going really skin, like beyond skin deep. And I think the, one of the questions that I've always found to be really useful is if you've done a bit of an exploration and a discovery, uh, speaking with your existing clients and your prospects as well, is you know you, you've got all the uh, all the answers to the questions you wanted. You just ask a simple question at the end. That is, if I could show you a way to make one pound investment turn into three, would you be interested in hearing about how we do it? And then all of a sudden, it's a completely irrelevant financial discussion because they're always thinking about return on investment rather than expenditure. So if you can prove that you can either add, add value or demonstrate a very quick return by monetizing that conversation, don't be afraid to ask those questions um, if, if you can prove it. Yeah, <clears throat> and I'll, I'll add to that, not everybody that you're dealing with will necessarily have a financial 
uh, metric that the, the, the lines of everybody gets measured by by something. <laughs> um, you know, we, we all get measured by by something. Um, so if you can actually understand how your 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 buyer is is uh, being measured on what metrics they're trying to impact, whether it's you know in HR for example it's retention or um, you know in, in operations it's throughput. You know, it, it, there is always something that people are trying to uh, improve one way. They're not trying to do more of it or less of it. If you can understand why that is and show how you can actually help that. Um, you know, that will help you because you'll be, as I say, you know, in my experience, part of those conversations. Whereas other people who can't have that conversation uh, won't get won't get the uh, the time to to actually sort of have those sort of discussions. Brilliant, awesome. So, what, what's next on the hit list? Well, I think if we looked at, at um, value value proposition, um, the thing I'd like to sort of kind of goes along that. Once you kind of got that idea sort of sorted out generally and, and sort of really thought, okay, so um, here, here's my customer base. Here's, here's the sort of customers I, I typically go, go go after. But even within that group of, of customers, that market, there are some that are more important than others, and some you've you've probably concentrated on your priority customers. So we're talking here about you know segmentation customers, whether you've done it consciously or you, you do it unconsciously, you know that oh yeah, I, I'll spend more effort on, on this group of customers than, than that group of customers. I think now's a good time to actually review um, that sort of segmentation in, in the sense that uh, as we found out in, in, in the pandemic, you know, there's, there's, uh, some sectors did really, really well. Um, and some sectors did really, you know, that just that was just the nature of the the outcomes of, of that particular event. You know, sort of, uh, I, I do kind of work up at Gatwick, and they're still recovering from the fact that Gatwick was not operational for eighteen months because just so much was linked into uh, the Gatwick uh, airport economically. So, um, you know, who who in your customer base are likely to be doing okay? Um, because they, they've actually got their own proposition is strong enough uh, in, in, a, in a downturn. And who might be some of the losers? Um, so <laughs> come back to training firms then, you know, so and we were talked about, you know, those, those sort of services which are seen as kind of non-essential. Non um, so, uh, and which of your customers are actually, can you see are trying to make an effort to actually not do business as usual, but change the way they do business as, as well. So there's a, a few things I think to play around with that. Just sort of step back and uh, and again, this is all about things that you can do within your control. You know, what will actually happen in the economy will, will happen in the economy. Um, but what we want to kind of do is, is sort of think about things that we can take control of and have, have influence over. And, and, the, and the way we think about who, which customers to, um, to prioritize, uh, what we talk to them about, are within our control. There's things that we can actually sort of wake up in the morning and think, yeah, that's what we're going to do today. So I think, you know, thinking about your segmentation, um, ask yourself the question, okay, I'm look at my customer base. Are there some that, you know, obviously I should keep investing in? Um, are, are there some that, actually, I haven't paid them much attention, but, yeah, maybe they could be something that, so a customer that we could actually sort of spend a bit more time working on because, it, you know, they might be an essential service, for example, that's likely to be able to sort of keep continuing. Um, and, you know, a bit more sort of time and energy going into understanding their issues, what they're trying to do, how they're dealing with uh, circumstances at the moment. Again, we'll perhaps, you know, raise your profile and get you into conversations you might not have had previously. And are you, are you doing that through um, any sort of assessment or scoring? So something I've seen work well in the past is just get a spreadsheet put all your clients in it current future past and do a, almost like a rag scoring red amber green so red you know there might be some criteria around budget or location or buying yeah. power whatever it is and have a number of criteria and then put a red amber or green next to it and then the ones that are that are all greens and ambers prioritize those is, is, is can it be that simple or is there anything i, I think it can be that that simple I, i've sometimes tried to work with customers to try to make that sort of thing really complicated <laughs> so they come up with a, a precise answer i mean what, what you're looking for is is um it's a, bit, it's a bit like a map isn't it you just want a, a map to show you which direction you should 
you should you should go in. Yeah. Um, you know, and I think what you described there, Ben, is is is, is probably um, a, a really good sort of you know starting starting point just to get something. Work out the criteria. It's the, it's the criteria that are important. Um, you know, and obviously that will depend on each individual's business circumstances and the markets they're in. Yeah. Um, you know, what, what's important to those those, those customers? Uh, what's important to you as as, as well? Um, but, I, but I think you know. Um, one of the things I would put down a criteria right now is um, how easy is it to service this customer, both in, in terms of, you know, does it take a lot of, lot, lot of effort? Uh, if I go after another customer in the, in the same area, you know, well, am I doubling my, my effort, for, for example? So, you know, as well as customers who might be um, good, good, good for you, you're good for them, think about are they good for you? Yeah, <laughs> uh, absolutely. Uh, well, one of the ones I used to do is, um, when I'd work in media, I'd find the ones that would consistently buy throughout the year. Yeah. Uh, maybe not like every month, but they were always coming back over and over and over. And so when it started to get into the, the uh, quieter seasons, like so Christmas and August were always very difficult to sell around at those points in time. You'd go to the ones that were buying a lot consistently. And instead of saying, well, stop buying consistently, buy in bulk now. Uh, and, you know, there, there is, if you know, if you want to get people to front load investments into you and your services or products uh you know then you might want to incentivize those conversations as well might be another angle i'm just talking for for what worked for me in one example at that point in time yeah and i think that that's you know that comes down to um uh, another sort of idea is actually what, what can you do to change the nature of the relationship so it's more attractive to to, to the customer um, you know, uh, it's somewhere I hate to go, but uh, terms and conditions. Uh, I'm always very strong as, as having the tightest terms and conditions you possibly can as, as a supplier. But it's, it's a difference between, you know, sort of, and, and again, if you, can, if you can finance, you know, an extra two or three days, um, well, then that's fine. That's just an example. Of, you know, sometimes we did, we did that. Uh, back in the day, but I was part, of, fortunately, part of an organisation that that could could support that. Um, but I, mean, I did a lot of internal selling to get that. But you know, as a, in, in sort of, but so, so there are things that we can control in the nature way we deal with customers. And I think if there's things you can find that are you know, low cost to your potential high value to your your customer, um, and. Most customers these days in, in, in 2022 operate off very lean systems. So, um, you know, what we, some of the things I do sometimes is I, I volunteer to do some of the work for them. Um, that gives me two advantages. One is I know it's going to get done in the way it should get done. So it actually adds, adds momentum to the opportunity I'm pursuing or the project I'm, I'm developing. Um, uh, and actually, it makes, it makes sure that um, it's seen as, as real added value because you know you, I never lose an opportunity to tell people it's it's added value. Um, Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Don't don't do it, and they think it's normal. Is it? <laughs> yeah, exactly. By the way, mate, I am going above and beyond here just so uh, that you haven't missed that. Just so you know. Yeah, yeah. So I, I think there's um, you know, in, in, and that comes back to actually understanding. Um, you know what are the critical points, and what are the the, you know, the pinch points that your customers are ex experiencing? So if you can find a way to um, uh, alleviate that, that, that that's kind of really really helpful. Um, I, I mean, it's I don't know if anybody has a sort of. I, I once worked with a customer who actually uh, serviced uh, a manufacturing plant, um, and they were on. All under all sorts of competitive pressure. What they kind of eventually worked out was that actually, at the end of this production process that they brought raw ingredients into, there was some, uh, you know, in, in, in good old industrial days, we called it slag. You know, there was some. So they knew their trucks were going in. So what they organised was to actually take that stuff away whilst they're in their trucks and just sort of uh, recycle it. So, because the customer was finding that really difficult to deal with because they didn't have the necessary um, qualifications or, or licenses or what it is, whereas our customer did. So, they, just by understanding the way that the customer was working, where the pinch points were, 
they they found a way to actually add some real value uh, and they can then, you know, and they made it very difficult for a competitor to come in and take that business away from them because they, they built themselves into as a, a part of the customer's process. Yeah. Very true. Very true. Make yourself uh, unforgettable. Yeah. And then, and what about, I, th- I think in terms of uh, one thing that we get a lot of questions about is how do I get in front of the right people? You know, I don't want to be salesy. You know, what should I be sending to people? You know, what, have you got anything around you know, that within your strategies in terms of sort of awareness or? Yeah, I, th- I think once you've, um, you've kind of worked through your, 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 your priority customers, and then if you've kind of spent a bit of time researching, you know, what it is that they're working on, um, or you, you might have, you know, your own market knowledge, you know, what's it? To, I, I'll give you a really straightforward example. Uh, having been a sales director myself with sales teams, um, I, I find it very easy to say to sales directors, uh, I can imagine this is the sort of thing you're thinking about, about right now which allows me to, to have those sort of conversations. So just using our sort of situational awareness of what it's like to be, you know, whoever your typical customer is, because uh, you pick up experience, um, allows you to sort of put together some very specific targeted uh, ideas for them. And as much as you can, I'd, I'd really encourage you to find a way to make that a, um, a, a sort of what we call a, a, a financial proposition or a, a metric based proposition. Um, you know, so it's very easy for me to, sell, to say to sales directors, um, you know, I, I can help improve your sales team's productivity by 10, 15, 20% or, or, or whatever it is by focusing on, on these things. And, you know, so if, if your revenue is, is say, 100, you know, what would it be like if your revenue was 115% of what it is now? Um, and I know what their revenue is because I've kind of done my research and the investment would be X and therefore your return is 10 to 1. Now, hopefully I'll get a conversation as a result of that that idea. Um, So if you can find something that you know, a metric you can impact, um, if you think about the work you've done in the past, and some people do this, you know, as, as a good habit, um, I'd encourage you right now to go back and look at your case studies and think about, okay, so when I did that, what was the outcome? Uh, but what was the outcome in terms of, of a number or a metric? Because that's going to be very helpful then in saying to an executive or a business owner that I want to get in touch with, you know, I can help move this number from here to here. And how do I know? Because I've done it in the past with somebody who does a similar type of business or a similar type of role. And, you know, that's the start of a, of a conversation because then you get the opportunity to go in and actually have a conversation about what their real situation is and then what you can do for them specifically. Yeah. The, the thing I like is, like, just remember that you're not trying to sell your product or service. You're just trying to pick interest right so i'm going to tell you about what you could have over here (laughs) this is what you could have and then they're like okay right i'm interested in what i could have tell me how i actually get there and that's what gets you to the table not giving everything away um straight away and saying you know what what it is that we're going to do and how we're going to do it but like you said the word there is outcome sell the outcome uh, the thing that they want not the thing that you do um I know uh, Kate's on the call here. Um, Katerina did a, did a brilliant video because um, I hope you don't mind me saying it, it's public domain. But um, uh, I think one of the prospective businesses was uh, was Jaguar Land Rover, and um, so literally just not not just went out of the way to do a case study, having not worked with them, but went out of the way to make a, a video production about how much her company would like to work with that that organisation as well. So. You know, I've worked with job seekers before. I've worked with um, young people trying to make their way into industry. And what we've got to do is stand out. And if we go through traditional methods, I'm just going to send a LinkedIn message. I'm just going to send one email. I'm just going to apply for one job. You're going to look like everyone else. Whereas if you break the rules and approach people, be brazen, you know, go out, out of the box and, uh, you know, try something different to, to get that attention. It will definitely work. But I think you're absolutely right. Prove the outcome, prove the passion, 
uh, and that that will help you get a seat at the table for a conversation way way more than uh, than those people just sending out 100 emails a day hoping for the best yeah yeah and I, I think you know you're, you're, you're right Ben I, I, there's always a, a phrase I swing some minds that you know, cut through the noise you know because um, you know, I, I talk to quite a few people in, in my area, um, you know, and they're, they're just bombarded with emails. Um, so, you know, one, th one thing that I would certainly encourage people to do is, is just pick up the phone and, and phone people. Yeah. Um, and some people <laughs> sort of say, well, we never get a phone, nobody phones us. Um, um, you know, uh, and, and the, first, the first phone call should not last more than 30 seconds. It's just a permission can I get this idea in front of you? Yeah, the, the permission-based opener. So I've been yeah. working with a couple of businesses on this. Yeah. And that's, uh, you don't go in with a sly cold call anymore. Just let me, you know, I'm going to try and get as much words as I can before you put the phone down on me. It's actually, you know, own it. This is a cold call. Have you got five seconds or I can just talk to you about this thing? If you're not interested, you've got, you've got an opportunity to hang up and never speak to me again. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. So the world yeah. is changing. And I would encourage you know, be, and again, you know, my, my cold call is based around the fact, you know, I'm a former sales director. I know how difficult it is to move uh, the needle. You know, uh, I'd like to have a conversation when it's convenient for you about how I can help improve productivity by 15, 20% because I've done that with my own teams and I've done it with other people's teams. You've got my attention. Yeah. I mean, I mean. yeah. yeah. So find your own metric. Find, find the metric that's relevant to the person that you're, you're, you're targeting. Yeah. Um, because we all have a, we all have a measure, um, and uh, we we you know if you can understand what it's like to be in the shoes of your, your customer and what they're concerned about, um, you know it's, it's like the cocktail part. It's just called, it used to be called the cocktail party effect. I don't know if anybody goes to cocktail parties these days, but there's all that hubbub going on, and someone says your name, and you suddenly turn around. You know, because you, you you're tuned in to listen out for your for your name. It comes from our childhoods. Um, you know, I could always tell by the tone of my mother's voice that I was in, in trouble. So, still there, <laughs> so, still there. <laughs> so it's um, yeah. So, we, so you know, if you can if you can align yourself with things that people are thinking about and tuned into, um, it's it's not spam. It's it's actually the welcome information. Absolutely. So we've got uh, five or ten minutes left on here. I mean, what, what else have you, uh, can you impart on us, David? I think the one thing that I, I, I kind of, strategy number seven, uh, which underpins everything else that I think we've been, been talking about. Um, and it, this is so perhaps, you know, uh, there's, there's six other things I, I've talked about, all of which involve uh, maybe a change of, change of approach. And as we know, changing our habits is, is actually hard to, to do um, because the habits, the way we work is um, we, we have all our routines set up and we do the things that we do, um, you know, and, and there's a lot more neuroscience that tells us that actually 95% um, of the time we're not thinking about the things we do. We're only conscious of 5% of, of stuff that's going on around us. So actually changing a habit takes takes time and time and, uh, and effort. So I think it's important to maintain your uh, your motivation and, and, and energy uh, as, you, as you're doing this. Um, and you know whatever you take take out of this, um, set yourself up for success in, in changing the way that you, you, you do things. Um, if you've identified there's an action that you want to uh, want to do might well, might be a segmentation task or a, you know, a, a messaging task or something like that. Kind of break it down um, into, into small smaller chunks. Chunk it down. Um, it's much easier to achieve once you achieve a hundred percent or ten percent of the things you want to change. You've made a start. You can tick that box and you, you can move on, rather than actually you know try and do the hundred percent in one go and fail and then feel that you've wasted that time and time and energy. So we, we're all motivated by different things. We all have different motivators. But just think about you know as you kind of maybe think about how you're going to address the challenges ahead and certainly there is going to be trouble ahead. You know, what's in it for you? What's your drive? What drives is it going to meet for you? Um, you know, I, I, I kind of have bad days like everybody else, 
But what's important to me is actually the, the, the quality of the work and the impact I've, I've, I've made. So if I'm having a bad time, I just go to this folder I've got of, of it's, it's quite a thin folder, but, you know, nice things that people said about the work I've, I've, I've done. Uh, and that's enough just to get me going and get me energised again. So find, find a way that you, know, you can actually go to your, your energy store, top up your batteries and, and, and keep going. Uh, you know, and maybe some of the, the network and the organisation like South Sellers, so South Coast Sellers Club is a good place to go and tap into as well. Yeah. And on, on that point, I mean, I'll be sending out a link to everybody to come and join the, um, the Second Voice Slack channel. And I know people will come in and ask questions every now and then. And there's, uh, you know, you're more than welcome to, to join that and ask questions. So as we've gone through this process, as we've gone through um these strategies you know come and ask how you're going to do it for your specific business if you're not comfortable talking about it here um but we'll also share specifically what those what those seven main strategies are uh so just a quick review um so look at the value in the services or products uh, of your product or service value proposition uh check your market segment Segmentation, you know, does it still make sense? Who are those primary accounts that are going to do well and carry on doing well? And, you know, get on those coattails and continue working with those. And um, look for that customer insight. What, are, what is that customer focused on specifically and how can you bolt on and add value? Uh, and then make sure you're building out those value propositions um, to specifically talk to that customer about that thing. So, you know, if they are focusing on, um, reducing overheads in a specific department and that's something that you do make sure that your value proposition is all geared around that um, David spoke about joining up the dots so marketing and sales collateral you get that up to date make sure you're talking about the right messages make sure that you're really hanging off of those successful case studies or if you don't have case studies yet make uh, documentation and, and create uh, literature about what you can do, what you're going to, what you've done in previous roles to show that you can prove um, and deliver against those successes. Uh, remember that we're going to be managing bigger opportunities. So there's more uh, stakeholders involved. The buying cycles are a lot longer. Uh, and we understand now that the behaviors of our buyers and our users uh, and even our advocates have changed. So their motivation is going to be different. So think about what they might be. Uh, and the last point I think is probably arguably the most important one, looking after up here and maintaining that motivation and energy. And um, so one thing you've probably seen me swaying around, I, I don't sit down at a desk hardly ever at all. Uh, not everyone is um, able to have standing desks, so I respect that. But one thing that you can all do is if you're doing calls, if you're doing meetups, get your headphones in and go for a walk and do it. So get moving, get outside, and amazingly, go look at things that are green. And it does wonderful things for our memory, our mind, and the way we are feeling. But ultimately, um, you know, use each other, use us, and, uh, and keep sharing those ideas. And we'll be able to feed in and support into your businesses in any which way. Um, I think I've covered that off. David, have I missed anything there? I think, I, I think, I think that's a great summary, then. Awesome. You might be able to tell that I had that written down. So, um, yeah, not, not off the cuff, that one. Um, we are going to wrap up now. So I just want to thank you all for, for turning up. And uh, David, thank you very much for joining us today and imparting your wisdom. Really kind of you. I've been Ben Bennett. You've been wonderful. Thank you very much. And see you very soon.